Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. But if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is seen. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. But just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If, you, if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patience, endurance, the same suffering we suffer. And our hope for you is found firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Now we know if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. But while we are in this tent, we groan in a burden we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. 
Therefore, we are always confident. No, that as long as we are in home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, I would prefer to be away from the body than at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it. But we must all appear for the judgment seat of Christ. Each one may receive what is due him for all things done in the body, whether good or bad. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. Time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed, are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, bountifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, I, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the land, lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the trees for the healing of the nations. No longer will it be cursed. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of a sun. The Lord God will give them light. They will reign forever and ever. Show me 
oh Lord, my life's in. The number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He rustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. And now, Lord, what do I, who, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all our generations. For the mountains were born, you were brought forth the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, return to dusk, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. and They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and indignation. Yet you have set our iniquities before us and our secret sins and the secret of the place. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days, 70 years or 80. If we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Teach us to number our days aright. We may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O oh God, how long it will be. Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many days as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to your children. May the favor of the Lord, our God, rest upon us, establish us, the works of our hand. Yes, establish the works of our hands. You may be seated. Father has compassion on his children. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we were formed. And he remembers that we are but dust. As for men, his days are like grass, flourishes like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it and is gone. Its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his righteousness with their children's children.
who can find an excellent wife? Who can find a virtuous woman? She is far more precious than jewels. Heart, she does good and not harm all the days of her life. She's like the ships of a merchant who brings food forth afar. She rises while there's yet night, provides food for her household, and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. The fruits of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself strong and makes her arms strong. She perceives that there is merchandise and she buys it. She puts her hands to the staff and her hands to the spin. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Let us celebrate our beloved sister, Congresswoman the Honorable Eddie Bernice Johnson. the members of the Johnson family, Kirk and Sandra, and Sister Sally Moore, and to the grandsons, great-grandchildren, our hearts and our prayers are with you and your family, both today and the days ahead. Know that this city of Dallas and all of us that love Congresswoman Johnson will continue to keep you lifted in our prayers members of the clergy, members of Congress, members of the Black Congressional Caucus, to all of our elected and appointed officials, to all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we gather today to celebrate the life, the legacy, and the labor of our beloved sister, the Honorable Eddie Bernice Johnson. Congresswoman Johnson, or EBJ as some affectionately refer to her, was beloved by this city, beloved by this state, and this nation. My name is Brian Carter, and it is my privilege to serve as your officiate, officiate on today. And at the request of the family, we are honored to be able to host today's services. The family has worked through this program to, to put together a program that they believe celebrates and honors the legacy of their mother. And so we want to honor that in every way. The Bible says in Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. It's as though the text says that when God looks and sees one of his faithful servants, that has now been called home. He calls that precious. It means that when he sees it, he views it as, as, a, as a person of high value, one of his faithful servants that God is leaning in on today. And as he leans in, he celebrates the life of Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. He celebrates her because she was a faithful servant of his. All of us have been to graduations. When we go, we often try to look in the book to find the name for our loved one. And we know that there are times when there is an asterisk by certain names. And then when we look at the legend, the asterisk tells us there is something special about that person. Sometimes the asterisk will mean that they graduated cum laude, which means they graduated with honor. Or sometimes it says summa cum laude, which means they graduated with great honor. And other times it says magna cum laude, 
which means with the greatest honor. And for some of us, it was thank you, Lordy, which means we glad we we glad we just made it to the line. Today we celebrate a woman that was at the head of her class. She was not just deserving of honors, but the highest of honors. She was not just in the top 10%. She was the valedictorian of her class. She was that because of her works that God did through her. Her character, her leadership, her fight, her tenacity, her dignity, her diligence, and her determination. And so we gather today to give her the highest honor we possibly can. We are here to agree with what Matthew 25 and 23 says. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. We gather to celebrate her. We celebrate her because she sacrificially served the citizens of Dallas, the state of Texas, and the nation. We will forever cherish her memory. So thank you, Congresswoman Johnson, for your leadership. Thank you for lifting your voice for those who didn't have a voice. Thank you for standing strong. Thank you for working across the aisle. Thank you for staying for 50 years of public service. Thank you for your tenacity. Thank you for fighting against racism and discrimination. Thank you for advocating for the marginalized and the oppressed. Thank you for breaking barrier after barrier after barrier after barrier. Thank you that because of you, we have better transportation we have better education we have better technology we have better health care we've got better housing we've got better access to capital because of your legacy today we gather to celebrate her life her legacy her leadership and her labor because it is well deserved today we have a host of of individuals that will be coming today to help be a part of this celebration that the family has put together. The first part of our program involves the clergy because the faith community was such an important part of her life. Every year, she hosted a prayer breakfast where she would gather pastors across the city for us to pray together, for us to be inspired by a speaker. I want to now, I want to invite all of the clergy in the room to please stand at this time. All of the pastors in this room, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership and partnership with Congresswoman Johnson. We're going to ask my friend and my brother, Pastor Frederick Haynes, is going to come, the pastor of the Friendship West Church, as well as the president of the Rainbow Bush Push Coalition. He's going to share our prayer, and then following that, we'll hear our scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, from Reverend Sylvester Chase, Jr. He is the pastor of the Wesley United Methodist Church of Austin, Texas. And then following that, we'll have a congregational hymn that will be led by the Dallas Community Choir. This choir you see behind us is a choir of friends of Congresswoman Johnson. They are composed of choir directors and musicians and singers all across this city that have been practicing to prepare for the day. Can you celebrate them? They are here today to lead us in worship throughout today. Let's now receive Pastor Haynes at this time. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we thank you and praise you for the comforting ministry of your Holy Spirit, the healing power that comes from your word. And then, God, we thank you for our hope rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that death cannot have the last word. And now, God, we thank you and praise you that you chose to gift us with this wonder of a woman from Waco, Eddie Bernice Johnson, we thank you that she faced down the double barrel shotgun of racism and sexism and became a barrier breaker and a difference maker. We thank you and praise you that when Maya Angelou decided to write the poem Phenomenal Woman, Eddie Bernice Johnson embodied that. And so we thank you for the poetry of her life. But we also thank you, oh God, for the prose of her life. 
and that she dared to get in the trenches and stand for what is right in the face of so much wrong. We thank you and praise you, O oh God, that in her life she not only broke through barriers, but she broke through barriers, O oh God, and opened doors, content simply not to be the first, but to be a wedge under that door so that others could pass through it. And so we thank you for Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. We thank you for the honorable Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson for every life she touched, for every door she opened, for the strength that she demonstrated. And then, oh God, we thank you that this woman, who we can also call Shaka Khan's every woman, shared love with her family. And so we thank you for her family. We thank you that she showed us what it meant to be a mother who doted over her son and raised him in the fear and admonition of thee. Thank you, O oh God, for, for being a loving grandmother and great-grandmother who embodied the fact that ain't no love like grandma's love. Thank you, O oh God, for what she meant as a family woman. And now, God, we thank you and we praise you that she has already heard your welcome voice say, well done, because she well did. May we, O oh God, who desire to hear you say, well done, spend the rest of our lives well doing, as we thank you for the gift of this Wonder Woman from Waco, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, we place her family in your hands, comfort them, heal them, grant them peace, and walk with them as they navigate this season of grief. We ask it all in the matchless name of the one who is the resurrection and the life, even Jesus Christ we pray, amen and hallelujah. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Thanks be to God that Kurt and the family y'all live there in Austin. So mama had to come to Austin all the time. Amen. And one thing I knew when she was coming to town, I was going to get an invitation to come eat. Amen. And truly, we would sit down at the table and eat and eat and talk and talk. And then and she could continue to talk. <laughs> Amen. But uh, as we come to read the scripture, she was a woman of faith, believed in God and we had her at Wesley United Methodist Church to come and speak to us on our Women's Day. And thanks be to God to someone who can always have a word too from the Lord. And one of her favorite scriptures came from the psalmist in that 27th book of Psalm. Verses 1, 2, and 3. May I know why she was able to be so strong and how she was able to hang on in there. For that psalmist says, and this is what EBJ was really saying to her, herself, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though and host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war 
should rise against me, in this I will also be confident. And now Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 sums it up and what she tells us. Verses 10 and 11, finally, finally, my brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then she says to us in this 11th verse, Paul, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God and the people of the faith community here say, amen, amen, amen. meant that she would go to every every part. She would go to every level to be able to get what she needed for her community. Uh, of course, President Biden came on last night to be able to visit with the family, which affirmed the great impact. We already knew how great she already was, but his presence last night affirmed the continued work and the impact of her legacy upon our nation. We now want to hear from two additional administrations as they also share about the impact that she had. First, we'll have a video uh, preaching the Honorable Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States. And then directly following that, we'll have another video a message from the Honorable William Jefferson Clinton, the 42nd President of the United States. Let's watch these. 
Greetings, everyone. To Kirk Johnson and to the entire Johnson family, it is an honor to celebrate the incredible life and legacy of Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Today, we gather to remember a great American leader, a trailblazer, a public servant, a visionary who saw our nation as it could be and dedicated her life to make that vision real. A nurse by training, Congresswoman Johnson always used her position of leadership to bring healing and hope to the people she served. As the first woman and the first black person to chair the House Science Committee, she worked to make sure that every young person in our nation, no matter who they are or where they live, can realize their ambition and aspiration and pursue a career in STEM. And she was an essential partner to President Biden and me in the passage of the Chips and Science Act. Congresswoman Johnson served in the United States Congress for 30 years. In that time, she was always fighting for the people of Dallas, for the people of Texas, and for the people of America. Her life will inspire generations to come. May God continue to bless the entire Johnson family. Take care. I so wish I could be with all of you in Dallas to celebrate the remarkable life of my longtime friend, Eddie Bernice Johnson. We met more than 50 years ago when I came to Texas to work for the Democratic presidential campaign, and she was making her first attempt, successful I might add, to become a member of the legislature. From that day till the day I left office, she was always my friend in storm and sunshine. She was always fighting for people she believed in and causes she supported. The heat never bothered her. She just stood up for what she thought was right. If Eddie Bernice was your friend or you were supporting a cause she believed in, you never had to look over your shoulder to wonder where she was. We can be so grateful that when President Carter was in office. She was a powerful voice for fighting to expand civil rights, create good jobs, improve access to health care and education. And in 1992, when we went to Washington together, she was one of my closest allies for eight years. I'm so thankful that I had the chance to get to know her, to get to work with her, and to become her friend. I hope that all of you can take comfort in knowing that the work she did will give better lives to countless people, not just in our Dallas district, but far beyond across these United States. So we have to say goodbye, but we have never, never got to quit remembering, being grateful, and in our public lives, trying to be more like Eddie Bernice Johnson. She was one of a kind. We'll miss her, we'll love her, we'll always remember her. Congresswoman Johnson's exemplary leadership allowed her to be the first on a number of occasions. She was the first African-American to serve as chief psychiatric nurse at the Dallas VA Hospital. She was the first woman, black woman, ever elected to public office in Dallas. The first African-American woman to serve as regional director for the Department of Health and Human Services. She was the first woman elected to Texas Senate and the first African-American from Dallas area to hold the office since Reconstruction. She served for 30 years in Congress and 50 years of public service for the city, the state, and the nation. She was once asked, what do you want your legacy to be? She said, I want to be known as someone who did the work. Someone that did the work. <laughs> the rest of our program, or the next section of our program, will allow individuals to share about the work that she did, <laughs> how she impacted at every level. We're going to begin in a moment by hearing from uh, the Honorable Marsha Fudge, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing, in urban development. She'll be followed by the Honorable Hakeem Jeffers, 
Democratic leader of the U.S. House of Representatives, and then he'll be followed by the Honorable James Cleburne, Assistant Democratic Leader of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, and then following that, we'll have a selection, and then Ambassador Ron Kirk will come, former U.S. Trade Representative and former Mayor of Dallas. The Honorable Royce West, Texas State Senator, uh, District 23, who succeeded her in the Senate here. Rodney Ellis, of Harris County Commissioner. And then following that, we'll talk about her Dallas impact. The Honorable Eric Johnson, Mayor of Dallas, will share. Gary A. Slagle, Board Chair of DART Board of Directors, will share. And then concluding that will be Dr. Stephanie S. Elizada, who is Superintendent of Schools here at Dallas ISD. And so we're going to ask those individuals to come momentarily uh, to begin to share the reflections about the work that she committed. Before we begin that portion, I want to ask all elected and appointed officials to please stand at this time, local and state. Thank you so much for your leadership and your presence today. And then next, I want to ask all members of Congress to please stand, all members of Congress and the Congressional Black Congress to please stand. Thank you immensely for being with us today. We'll begin with the Honorable Marsha Fudge. To this podium on my left, your right, as, you, as your name is mentioned, please come forward. There's a clock here that gives you the time that you have allotted to you. Uh, that the family has given to us. And so we'd ask you please honor that so that we can honor the family's wishes as we continue to move forward throughout today's service. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Pastor. I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you for this honor today. You know, Kirk, when I was a teenager, and that's been a long time ago, I sang in the church choir. It was called the Young People's Choir. It wasn't called the Youth Choir then. And to this very day, I cannot carry a tune in a bucket. But my mother made me sing in the choir. And even then, one of the songs that I loved so very much says, touch somebody's life as you pass them. You may never pass that close again. You will be surprised just how soon that same touch comes back to you. I am not surprised of the touches in this room today. And I'm just so grateful that the Lord let me be on that journey so I could be touched by somebody like Eddie Bernice Johnson. Eddie Bernice Johnson possessed certain kinds of things that most people today don't. She possessed courage honesty, kindness, loyalty, grace. She was the person all of us, I think, wanted to emulate at some point. And all of those things she did in a place where they don't believe in any of it, the Congress of the United States. Now, if Eddie Bernice was on your side, you knew that you could stand straighter, that your voice was stronger, that your path was clearer, because you knew she always had your back. So today, I just want to say thank you. I want to say to my mentor and my friend, the gentle lady from Texas, farewell until we meet again. God is good, and all the time, to Pastor Carter, to Dr. Haynes, to other members of the clergy, to my colleagues in government, distinguished members of Congress, all those assembled, certainly to Kurt, and to the grandsons, the great-grandchildren, the Johnson family, all who knew and loved her. It is with a heavy heart that we gather here today to say our final official farewell to the iconic, the incredible, the incomparable Eddie Bernice Johnson. We're thankful for her. It's why you see more than 25 members of Congress from all across the country here.
to celebrate her legacy. And as we mourn her loss, we certainly are here to celebrate her life. What a life that she lived. A life filled with loving her community. A life filled with leadership for the people. A life that left behind a lasting legacy of transformational change. I first met Eddie Bernice Johnson when I showed up in Congress as a new member with Joyce and Robin and Mark V.C., Don Payne, Stephen Horsford, a little over a decade ago. We encountered each other at the CBC meeting, which meets every week. 12 o'clock on Wednesday, I walked into that meeting and it was filled with a room of nothing but legends like John Lewis, John Conyers, Charlie Rangel, Maxine Waters, Benny Thompson, the great Jim Clyburn, Elijah Cummings, and of course, Eddie Bernice Johnson. And I got to be honest, I'm thinking to myself, y'all, how did Hakeem Jeffries sneak into this room? <laughs> and then I had to figure out where I was going to sit. Because there's no assigned seats in the CBC meeting. But you know, it's like church. <laughs> you sit in the wrong place, <laughs> and you might have some challenges. <laughs> so thankfully, I caught Eddie Bernice's eye, and she said, sit right down next to me young man, and that's exactly what I did for years to come, getting the benefit of her wisdom, her warmth, her welcoming spirit. Now, in that first term, the chair of the CBC, she's now our great HUD secretary, was Marsha Fuzz. She said to Stephen Horsford and I, I want the two of you to preside over the CBC floor speech that occurs every Monday evening after votes. And so, we said yes, we didn't know what we were doing, y'all. But we said yes. And the thing about it is that the CBC floor speeches, an hour, Monday evening, people are all across town, not covered on CNN, not covered on MSNBC, not covered on BET, it's covered on C-SPAN. And so Stephen and I, we, we, we were never quite sure who exactly was paying attention. But we could always count on three people. Stephen's mother, <laughs> my mother, and Eddie Benice Johnson, our congressional mother. Uh, we were thankful for her always there for us as she has been for so many people. Such a spirit of generosity, insight, inspiration, and intellect. She's the one that got me started on my congressional journey within leadership. I got noticed that she wanted to see me on the floor of the House of Representatives. She summoned me to the House floor. And I got nervous, y'all, trying to figure out what I had done wrong because Eddie Bernice Johnson will tell you when you're messed up in a polite way. But she said, there's gonna be an opening on the CBC Executive Committee and I want either you or that other one. <laughs> she was talking about Stephen Horst, but she said, I want either you or that other one to run for the position and to try and work it out. 10 years later, Stephen Horsford is now the chair of the Congress Caucus, 60 persons strong. And I have the honor to stand before you as the highest ranking Democrat in the United States Congress. Thanks to Eddie Bernice Johnson, we worked it out, just like she'd been working it out for so many people. Across five decades of public service. I'm out of time, so I'll make one last observation. I think I can say with some degree of ecclesiastic certainty that Eddie Bernice Johnson is in a better place right now. She's up in heaven. I can say that with some degree of ecclesiastic certainty because I happen to see an advanced copy of the Heavenly Journal. That's the paper of record, y'all, from up above.
an advanced copy, and on the front page, there was a headline, and it said, Eddie Bernice Johnson arrives in heaven. I can't go through the whole article, but, but the article, it, it, it said that there was a three-person welcoming committee to greet her when she arrived at the pearly gates. First member of the welcoming committee was Sister Harriet Tubman. And the subheadline in the article said, legendary liberator greets legendary legislator. Uh, we know that for decades she helped to liberate people from this committee. Second member of the welcoming committee was none other than Rosa Parks. She was wearing pink and green. And, 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 and the subheadline, Kurt, uh, it said, quiet giant greets quiet giant. Uh, Rosa Parks, she sat down with quiet dignity so that everybody else could stand up. Eddie Bernice Johnson was a quiet giant. Uh, she taught us that you don't have to be the loudest voice in the room to get the most done. And that's what she did. Don't confuse the presence of dignity with the absence of determination. Eddie Bernice Johnson was both dignified and determined and one of the most accomplished legislators in the history of the United States Congress. <laughs> last member, last member of the welcome committee was the Honorable Shirley Chisholm. And the headline read, Trailblazer Extraordinaire greets trailblazer extraordinaire. Uh, we know that Shirley Chisholm was a great trailblazer, first woman ever elected to the United States Congress, but while Brooklyn has Shirley Chisholm, Houston has Barbara Jordan, North Texas has Eddie Bernice Johnson, and we're thankful for it. We're thankful she showed up. We're thankful she spoke up. We're thankful she stood up. And America is better off because of EBJ. God bless her memory. Kurt, I want to see you just after this program. Put me behind Hakeem. <laughs> Let me begin by recognizing the distinguished clergy, officers, members and friends of this great church, my colleagues in the Congress and my colleagues who were in the Congress and the members of this community. I often find myself quoting the great poet Robert Frost who once wrote two roads met in the wood. And I, I chose the one less traveled by. And that made all the difference. Now, I don't consider myself on the level of Robert Frost, and probably I shouldn't disagree with him, but I do. Because I sincerely believe that irrespective of what road you choose to travel, it is the people with whom you intersect that really makes the difference. The road that took me to Congress in 1992 intersected with the road that took Eddie Benice to Congress in 1992. But that's not where our lives first intersected. Eddie Benice Johnson and I met in 1972 at the Democratic National Convention. 
I was a delegate from South Carolina. She was a delegate from Texas. And many of you remember the turmoil in that uh, convention that led uh, to us, uh, our nominee, carrying only one state. We lost badly. And because of the turmoil, the president elected that year was Richard Nixon. Need I say more about what turmoil can lead to? But in that convention, a meeting took place, and I sat there watching and listening, and Eddie Bernice Johnson, who I did not know, took the mic. And when she finished her discussion, I said, I must meet that woman. And I did. And we became fast friends. And she went on to work in the Carter administration. And I uh, stayed in touch with Ada Bernice. And then we ended up in Congress together in 1992. For more than 50 years, she was a part of my life. And sitting next to her in what was then the Public Works Committee, sometimes observing her and, look, and then Corinne Brown, who is here, we sat there together figuring out how to get our airports better served, how to get our more roads and bridges in our communities, how to get things done for our constituents. I learned so much from Eddie Bernice Johnson. And if I were to try to describe her today for you, I would have to use the words of Carl Sandburg when he wrote of Abraham Lincoln. In his biography of Abraham Lincoln, Sandburg said that Lincoln was as strong as steel, yet as soft as the drifting fog. That was Eddie Bernice Johnson. Quiet, gentle, but as strong as steel. So as I close my remarks here today, I'm gonna ask my colleagues from the class of 93, Sanford Bishop, Bennett Thompson, Bobby Scott, to please stand, and Corinne, Please stand as I close. Bobby Rush. William Shakespeare wrote a sonnet that I think has particular meaning today as we celebrate the life and legacy of Eddie Bernice Johnson. It was signed at 116. He wrote, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bend with removal to remove, oh no. Love is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and it's never shaken love. Alters not with brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Love alters not with brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Is this the error? And upon me true, no man ever lived and no man ever loved. We love Eddie Denise Johnson, and she loved us.
congregation, to all of you assembled. The three of us decided to come here as one because the three of us, we had an argument whether Eddie adopted us or whether we adopted her. But we are so grateful to Kirk and Sandra and the family for allowing us to be a part of this remarkable woman's lives. I had the privilege of meeting Eddie Bernice Johnson when I was a teenager, and she and my mother were involved in Jack and Jill of America. They developed a lifelong friendship, and when Eddie was elected to the Texas legislature, she lived with my family. And little did I know, she started her stewardship of me. Now, you've heard about all her first. You've heard about all the remarkable things she's done. So I just want to take a minute to address one thing. How did she do this? We know all of the obstacles that came in her way, from Jim Crow to sexism and racism. And I was reading something, I don't know, two or three months ago. I love inspirational quotes from different people. And I saw this quote that has just stayed with me, and I couldn't understand why until I started thinking about what I had to say today. And the quote simply asked a question, makes the point, the magic that we seek is in the hard work that we are avoiding. And as I thought about that, you look at Eddie Bernice Johnson, all the things she accomplished, all the legislation that she passed, all the racism that she overcome, and think, how did she did it? It was the work. Eddie bathed in that hard work. And she brought her passion and her excellence and her love of her people to that task and never took her eye off the ball that she was privileged to be where she was to serve the people. And she did that and she did it well. I can tell you from the unique position of having worked with her as the head lobbyist for the city of Dallas, served my city as mayor, we were all richly served and blessed because Eddie Bernice did the work. And I want to say to those of you here who are not elected officials, don't ask us one more time what we got to do to make our country better. What do we have to do to get rid of all of the noise and the discord? If you were paying attention to the life of this remarkable woman, she's already given us the answer. Do the work. Kirk, Sandra, Sally, Johnson family, ministers on the roster. Eddie Bernice Johnson and I go back to like 1975. This is surreal. Our matriarch is gone. Lita Jeffries, you have come to know, and the members of CBC have come to know what we know here in Dallas County in terms of the greatness of Eddie Bernice Johnson. I'd ask all Dallas County, state, and local elected officials, current and former, to please stand up. This is the legacy of Eddie Bernice Johnson here lo locally. Our matriarch has gone on. A matriarch is a person that has wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Proverbs. Eddie Bernice Johnson did that. There may be some people in here that did not like Eddie Bernice Johnson, but they respected her because of the work that she did. What has she passed on to us, her political sons and daughters? Do the work. I recall when I became a state senator, she gave me a, a few choice words. I can't say all of them right now, <laughs> along with Barbara Jordan. But what she made certain of is that issues concerning health care, accessible health care, that we worked on those issues, higher education, education, historically underutilized business, uh, businesses, building coalitions 
based on interests, not based on the color of one's skin, gender, or political affiliation. And she often told us, just because you speak loud don't mean you're going to be able to get anything done. Her life is a manifestation of that. And so I would ask in closing that all of us stand and give Eddie Bernice Johnson a standing ovation for a job well done. Ministers of the cloth and Kirk and to Ada Bernice Johnson's family, she would love every bit of this ceremony. And she'd be so proud that so many of her colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus would be here. Like many of you, I knew all about Eddie Bernice Johnson before she knew me, because she was a public figure. I got to know her when I was chief of staff to one of her friends who was in the Black Caucus at that time, Mickey Leela. He invited her to come up to the Congressional Black Caucus. Ron Kirk was an intern, a staffer for Lloyd Benson. I was Mickey Leland's chief of staff. He told her he'd book her a hotel room, but he neglected to mention it to me. So she didn't have a hotel room. And then the congressman said, no problem, you can take my room. This is when they were meeting at the Washington Hilton. Well, the problem was he given his mama and his brother that hotel room. <laughs> so then he said, no problem. You can stay with me in my apartment and you can have Rodney's room. <laughs> so Eddie Bernice stayed there with us. And first bit of good advice she gave me was, you're not as smart as he thinks you are. Why would you be to the roommate to somebody you're working for? First, he's never going to pay his part of the rent. <laughs> Years later, I joined her in the Texas Senate. And I was having a little trouble coming off the Houston City Council, kind of remembering which way to vote, like I committed both ways. <laughs> so she said, look, it's a small body, 31 people, just two black ones in here. We don't need to get in a fight. So let's have this rule. Make me the last person you talk to before you go to bed. <laughs> what she didn't tell me was she went to bed about 1 or 2 a.m. <laughs> and then she said, here's the second part. Make me the first person you talk to when you get up. So we adopted that rule. Worked pretty good. She got her congressional seat and worked all right. We kept that habit all those years. My greatest regret is that until we get to the other side, she won't be the last one I talk to before I go to bed. God bless you, Eddie Bernice Johnson.
giving honor to God first and foremost and to all the clergy assembled here, all the dignitaries in the house, and most of all, uh, to the grieving family, Kirk and Sandra and all the grandkids and the whole family. I want to extend condolences to, to you, to the Johnson family, uh, on behalf of my family and, of course, on behalf of the entire city of Dallas. Um, you know, the mayor gets asked to do a lot of housekeeping, so I'm going to ask Madam or Mr. Timekeeper to cut me a break here because I do want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping. I've been asked to, to pass along a few condolences of folks who couldn't be here and some folks uh, who weren't on the program. I know that United States, former United States Senator and former um, NATO Ambassador K. Billy Hutchinson is in the House, and I know that former White House Counsel Harry Myers is in the House. And I was asked to pass on condolences to the family from former United States Secretary of Education Rod Page and his wife Stephanie Nellens Page from Houston, Texas. So I wanted to make sure that you knew about that. Um, I've known or I knew uh, Congresswoman Johnson for over 30 years. I met her when I was in high school. I also realized that even knowing her for 30 years, um, I didn't know her as long as many of the folks in this room. And I also didn't know her as well as many of the folks in this room. But over the last five years, since I've been the mayor of, of this great city, I've gotten to know her very well. We talked a lot, a lot, often. And when I say we talked a lot, these weren't high and by conversations either. Like this, we talked for hours when we talked about a lot of things. So what I wanted to do was to spend two minutes praising my friend, my mentor, the, the lioness of this city in our political world, in our black community, but I'm gonna do what I know she would want me to do based on what we talked about. I'm gonna tell you what she would want me to tell you today, not what I wanna tell you today. Because I wanna praise her, and I wanna talk about all the accomplishments and all the legislation. But she would want me to tell you these three things. She'd want me to tell you to knock it off. Knock it off. The divisiveness, the excessive partisanship, the ugliness, she'd say knock it off. Because she had very strong convictions. She had very strong beliefs. There's not a person who served in the Texas House or the Texas Senate or the United States House that felt any stronger about the things she cared about. But she also believed very strongly that you didn't have to be ugly to be strong and to stand for what you believe in. She was not an ugly person. She was a beautiful person. She would tell me, she would want me to tell you to get over yourself. Get over yourself. You're not the feature presentation of every show that you're in. You're not. She'd want me to make sure you understood that there's too much work to be done for all of us to be show horses all the time. Sometimes we got to be workhorses, and she chose to be the workhorse just about every time. She'd want me to tell you that. And finally, she'd want me to ask you, who do you love besides yourself? We all love ourselves. She loved herself. But she'd want me to ask you, who do you love other than that? Because I can tell you this, because we talked about it. She loved Dallas, Texas. She loved the state of Texas. She loved the United States of America. She loved the U.S. Congress. She loved the Congressional Black Caucus. She loved women across the globe. And I'm here to tell you, maybe above all of it, she loved black people. 
She loved us. She loved black Americans. She did. And she'd want me to tell you that all the stuff you've heard about and that you're going to hear about, all the accomplishments, all the things you, you read about, she'd want me to tell you she did all of that. Not for her. She did that for all of us. That's why she did it, because she loved us. And that's what she'd want me to share with you today. And that's why I'm very, very privileged to be here today. And thank you so much to the family for allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Johnson, for everything you did for us. We love you so much, and we're so thankful. And I'm going to give this resolution to the family today. I didn't want to read a resolution. I wanted to tell you what I thought she would want me to tell you. So God bless all of you, and thank you all for being here. Well, I want to tell you, um, I'm the chairman of the DART board, Dallas Area Rapid Transit. And our transit authority would not be what it is today had it not been for Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. She did an amazing job. She helped us build the system. We've worked with her for our 40 years of history. When I was mayor of Richardson, I knew her because she was very involved in building Dallas Area Rapid Transit and the go-to person that would help us get that done. It's interesting that without her help, we would not have the largest light rail system in the country. It's pretty amazing. She in her work with the Transportation Committee in Congress, she delivered nearly a billion dollars, a billion dollars over time to help us build what we have today, to improve the performance, to be able to have higher frequency and, <clears throat> and more bus routes within the communities of Dallas area that needed help. And she did that with so much pride. She was easy to work with. She helped us with, one of the things that's really important, I think, is that we have a Rosa Parks Plaza in the West End. And she helped us work through getting that done. And it's a place people can go and understand how important Rosa Parks was. Over time, we'll need to do something to help people understand how important Congresswoman Johnson was as well. But I'll tell you, we understand that the board of DART, the employees, the people who work there, love that woman and want me to recognize the family and say, you have our condolences, but thank you for all you've done and allowed her to do. We had a 40-year reunion recently. She was there. She spoke, she was so proud of what she helped develop. It's not the only thing she's done, as we've heard today. She has been so involved across this region, across the state, and across the country, and made a tremendous impact. We are just blessed and so fortunate that we had her. So from DART, thank you. Good morning to everyone, to all of the clergy, thank you, to the family. I'm very, very humbled to be able to say a few words about my brief relationship with Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. My name is Stephanie Elizalde, and I get to serve as the superintendent for Dallas Independent School District. Now, as an educator, I'm basically a rule follower. 
So I have to start by telling you, I felt like I needed to say, I yield my time to all of the Congress people speaking because they were going beyond the time frame, and it was making me very nervous. <clears throat> I think it's quite fitting that my relationship with Congresswoman woman Eddie Bernice Johnson is allowing me to take just a moment of an impact that she had allowing me to stand here as I think of all of the speakers that have come before me, and I'm asking myself, what's the little Latina girl from 3414 Buena Vista in Laredo, Texas, doing speaking at EBJ's funeral service? But it is because of her that I have this opportunity. And therefore, <clears throat> and I therefore consider it a great responsibility. So Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson had my cell phone and she used it a lot. If there were schools that were falling short in Dallas ISD, she was calling me. It wasn't to scold me, it was to remind me of the importance of public education and that she was there to support and to serve, she would always start by asking, how can I help? What do the schools need? That was quite refreshing from most of the calls I can tend to receive. She taught me so many lessons in such a few short years. She knew that public schools helped the people she was elected to serve if there was one thing I knew to be true about Congresswoman Johnson, it's that she stayed to connected to real people like me. I am extremely proud that Dallas ISD has an elementary school named in her honor. It's Eddie Bernice Johnson's STEM Academy. It is an absolutely gorgeous red brick building in a part of town where many of our families don't always have access to all the good stuff. And we came very close to naming it something else, by the way. So let me tell you just briefly how we, it actually came about. Newly elected trustee Maxie Johnson proposed that this brand new school be named for Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. In addition, Trustee Johnson, in collaboration with our founding principal, Emoja Turner, and his team, chose to focus on the sciences and got the school certified as a STEM academy. The board voted unanimously to name the STEM academy after Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, not because she was a politician, but we named it after her because she was a former nurse who chaired the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. She loved the school, and the school loved her. All our scholars now have access to the best science education that every child deserves. At the ribbon-cutting, Principal Turner, who I think is here today, promised her that every single student would be excited about STEM and would love the sciences just like she did. This is a promise we work to keep every single day. So when that morning bell rings, we continue her legacy of opening the doors wide to opportunity so that every single scholar gets a high quality education. And I can promise each of you, and especially her family, that the future is going to be better and brighter for these families because Eddie Bernice Johnson cared so deeply about what went on in our schools. And as I close and I reflect on her direct impact on my leadership, I was reminded of the poet laureate Amanda Gorman's words, and I believe these words capture the very essence of who Congresswoman Johnson is was and will always be. For when the day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light 
If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you, EBJ, for being our brave light. The light in me honors and respects the enduring flame that is and always will be our affectionate EBJ. also to recognize any congressional staffers or those who ever work for Congresswoman, Congresswoman Johnson in her office. Would you please stand? Because the work that she did was implemented by each of you. Thank you so much. As we move forward, we want to take a moment uh, to now move to a section to recognize some of the civic and service organizations that Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson was involved in. Uh, we were able to recognize Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Circlets Incorporated, Girlfriends Incorporated, Jack and Jill of America Incorporated, as well as Lynx Incorporated on yesterday. But also on today, we have the presidents, the national presidents for both, to, for two of these five organizations. If you are a part of any of these five organizations, would you please stand at this time? So we, we thank you for coming to celebrate her on today. You may be seated. At this time, we want, we want to ask Danette Anthony Reed, the international president and CEO of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated to come. She will be followed by Ethel Isaacs Williams, JD, national president of the Lynx Incorporated. That will have music, and then we will begin to hear from the family and family friends. As printed in the program, we will proceed in that order. Lucy Baines Johnson, daughter, President and Mrs. Lyndon Bates Johnson, followed by Les Weisbrooks, and then Roland Parrish, businessman and philanthropist. And then following that, the family will come and share remarks about Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Thank you. For if I've been an AKA, life owes me not, I live my day. To the Johnson family, and the wonderful clergy, and I'm joined by Joya Hayes, our South Central Regional Director. We are gathered here today not to mourn, but to celebrate an incomparable trailblazer, an icon of determination, dedication, and devotion to everyone who served while she led. It is my honor to say a few words about her today as my personal tribute. From the moment she determined to shatter the ceilings within her professional career as the first African-American to serve as chief psychiatric nurse at the Dallas VA Hospital, to becoming the first African-American woman to win the election to the Texas House of Representatives, and the first to win a seat in the Texas State Senate since Reconstruction to be elected as the first registered nurse ever to serve in the U.S. Congress, to being the first African-American and female to chair the U.S. House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, and as the first black woman to have an official portrait hung at the U.S. Capitol, her presence of poise and purpose prepared her to open doors across our nation and around the world. And as a 51-year member of the first African-American sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, she was always a first. Now, my sister was always supportive through her words and her actions. Quiet in spirit, but mighty in strength determination, dedication, and devotion. The Honorable Eddie Bernice Johnson lived, worked, led, and served in a manner expected of all of our members. She knew communities could become greater when equitable opportunities were available to them. She knew students could achieve more if they could find role models 
who looked like them. She knew there was much more this nation could bring to the world by being purposeful in finding real solutions to war, strife, and poverty. She was the perfect leader for times like these. The beauty of Eddie Bernice Johnson was that she was an encourager, a nurturer, and a mentor for countless people. A role model tirelessly as one of the most effective legislators and servant leaders in our community and nation. I am inspired by her life well lived, our bonds of sisterhood. Yes, I will miss her gentle counsel, her beautiful smile, and her warm laughter. I will cherish the special moments we shared here in the city of Dallas and in Washington, D.C., and at our conferences and special events. My sister, Eddie Bernice Johnson, gave everything within her body, mind, and spirits to others. I am, we are, grateful that we were able to join her on her journey. We thank God for her life, exemplary service, and leadership. It has been said that leadership is not about being the best. Leadership is about making everyone else better. My dear sisters, you made our lives and this world a better place. Well done, my dear sister, rest well. Good afternoon to the pastor, clergy, to members of Congress, past and present, Madam Secretary, to this amazing family and all who are gathered. What's so beautiful about this room is that it mirrors her life. She walked with kings and queens, but she never lost the common touch. So she would be comfortable in any room. She was that quiet giant of a person. She was also a 50-year member of the Lynx Incorporated. And I stand here as Ethel Isaacs Williams, the national president of the Lynx. I'm joined by two of my predecessors, our 15th national president, Margot James Copeland, and our 17th national president, Dr. Kimberly Jeffries Leonard who thought it not robbery to travel to be here to support this family. Thank you for the honor of the organization today. A good name, Proverbs 22 says, a good name is rather to be chosen than riches. And it is better, and favor is far better than silver or gold. I say to the family, especially those beautiful grandchildren, great-grands, and those yet unborn that will come. You have a legacy in your grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great to come. She had a good name. No scandal, no scuttled bucket, a good name. Better than any riches she may have accumulated, a good name favor of God upon her life. So that when you go to the train station, when you go to the halls of Congress, when you go past her elementary school, there you will see that good name of Eddie Bernice Johnson. I'm so wonderfully blessed to have had some time with her during this administration not just over my tenure in the organization, but in this administration, we honored her in September along with um, Congressman Clyburn. We honored her with the Legacy Award. And I said to her then, I said, could we please maybe have you do a little something after the retirement? She says, I'd be happy to because I won't be done working. And so I appointed her to be the honorary chair of our 44th National assembly that will convene in Tarrant County June of this year. Someone said to me when they heard of her passing, oh, you've, you had, she was going to be your honorary chair. I said, no, she is going to be and shall be our honorary chair posthumously. You know, I, as I close, I think about all of us who have traveled here. We came by bus, we came by airplane, 
whatever means of transportation, we made a reservation to get here. She too had a reservation to get from here to her internal rest. Her reservation could not be altered, could not be changed. She did her assignment, she ran her race, she fought her fight. She left us an assignment. So if we're gonna honor her, we're gonna vote. We're gonna make sure we keep doing the work. We're gonna show up. We're not just gonna be a member in name only. We are going to do all of those things. And there's a song that the hymn writer, we sang many times when we are assembled in church as we are the parting misfit, we say, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred pines is like to none above. But that third verse says, when we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, family. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Till we meet. gonna meet her here at Jesus' feet till, till we meet, till we meet at Ebernice again, God be with you. you and may God uphold you till we meet we're gonna meet her again
blind but now I I see to the clergy to the Congress, to the citizens of this great community. You were all Eddie Bernice's three homes, and I am so grateful to be at home with you. Kirk, our hearts are so heavy for you and your entire family. Your beautiful mother left us way too soon, but she leaves a lasting legacy of selfless service and moral courage in her public and private life that will endure. As everyone in this room can surely attest, to know your mother was to love her and generations of my Johnson family knew and loved her too. Your mother and my father only saw each other once. It was at the Texas Capitol a week before daddy died. Yet it seems to me as if he placed in his mission for a great society in her strong and capable hands that day, and she never let him down. Your mother's life compass was my father's life's compass, too. It always pointed true north for everybody, especially women and the disenfranchised. For decades, Eddie Bernice fought for social justice, civil rights, accessible health care, and educational opportunity in the capitals of her state and her nation. But she also fought for job creation and economic prosperity and for science. She did it all with grace and dignity and earned respect from both sides of the political aisle. She was the can-do person my father always sought to get the job done. And boy, did she get it done with over 300 bills passed. She was first because she was always willing to do the hard work. And she was 
always prepared. In July of 2022, I attended the Texas State Democratic Convention here in her beloved Dallas. The room was electric. It was Eddie Bernice's big night. She was retiring from 50 years of an incredible career in public service and justly received a roaring standing ovation. All who had the privilege of speaking that night, including me, sang countless praises about her accomplishments, just as we have today. Yet the ever humble Eddie Bernice Johnson passed the praises on to her constituents, her fellow legislators, and her Texas president, who had entrusted his dream to her over half a century before. Everyone needs someone to believe in. Eddie Bernice was my someone. I am a former nursing student who spent over half a century advocating for higher education in nursing. Eddie Bernice was my heroine and that of nurses everywhere, always leading us by example with determination preparation, and wisdom. Unprepared, that was me. When I heard of Eddie Bernice's untimely passing, somehow I thought she would always be with us. Always. And I cannot bear the thought that she is gone. Eddie Bernice Johnson was the uniter we needed in this very debate time. The weight of her work now feels too much to carry, but carry we must. <laughs> to justify her sacrifice for us, I now have 14 grandchildren, and Eddie Bernice always steps ahead of me, has not only grandchildren, but great-grandchildren. Their world continues to face the injustices that she fought against. For Eddie Bernice, for the children, for all of us, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday, we must. <laughs> Members of Congress, distinguished guests, ministers, family, and friends. She called me her brother from another mother. I called her my older sister. We knew each other for 55 years. My father, who was active in the Dallas County Democratic Party, was her accountant. He prepared her tax returns. When I was 15 years old, my parents invited her over for a Friday night Shabbat dinner, and we became friends. In 1973, she went to the legislator, legislature in Texas as a state representative. I went as a legislative staffer for then newly elected state representative Jim Maddox while I was in college. I got a semester's college credit for being his legislative aide. I graduated early from college so that in 1975 I could come back to the legislature and be Jim Maddox chief of staff and the original founding director executive director 
of the Texas House Study Group, a group of 65 state representatives who we did bill analysis, legislative drafting for the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in 1975. That, that organization still exists. Eddie Bernice Johnson was on my executive committee. She contributed part of her office salaries, staff salaries, as did other members, for me to have a staff, which included my older brother who just graduated from law school. It was then that I learned that she was brilliant and that she knew an incredible amount about legislative strategy. And we continued discussing legislative strategy for the rest of her life. I went from the legislature to law school and in 1978, shortly after I graduated law school, she asked me to be her personal attorney. And I remained her personal attorney. We had many, many, many occasions that we shared together. She was at all of my significant family events. She spoke when my 35-year-old daughter was first a baby at her baby naming. She spoke at, my, at the funeral of my 99-year-old mother about three years ago. And it was then that I found out that she talked a lot more to my mother than I knew about. And she told me that what she discussed with my mother was none of my business. <laughs> I have many stories about Eddie, obviously not the time, not enough time to tell them all, but I'll tell you just a few. Um, as you've heard, she was a fashionista. She, uh, her favorite place to shop was the Neiman Marcus Last Call while she was in Austin and the St. John's Outlet when she went to D.C. So one time in the 90s, um, <laughs> we were in D.C. for a trial lawyer meeting and she insisted on driving my wife and my wife's friend of an English lawyer, girlfriend, that was wife of an English lawyer to the outlets in Maryland. Should have been a one hour drive. For Eddie Bernice, it was about a two and a half hour drive. And it took my wife about an hour to get up the nerve to ask her to turn on the air conditioning in the car. I think everyone appreciated when Eddie Bernice wasn't driving herself anymore. She loved costume jewelry. So one time, she had a women's event at our house where she had a costume jewelry designer for Neiman Marcus come for an event with Nancy Pelosi. She often used our house for her events and her fundraising events because as all of you members of Congress know, she was a terrible political fundraiser because she didn't want to ask anybody for money. So it fell upon me to be her primary political fundraiser in the course of her career in the Senate and in Congress. Something that very, very few people knew, the year of 1992, her last year in the Senate, when she was running for Congress, she was employed by my law firm as a nurse paralegal. She took great interest in my cases and in my career. I was there when she was sworn in, first time as a state senator, first time as a US congresswoman, when in 1982, I was the president of our national trial lawyers organization, the American Association of Justice, and I was sworn in in Philadelphia. Eddie Bernice Johnson was there to speak at my swearing-in in Philadelphia. Thank you so much. I, I have just a few more minutes, and the family, the, fam, the family told me that I could take just a few more minutes. So please allow me 
sir, the, the Congress has to catch a plane and get back, so we're trying to give our pastor enough time to share his message. I will do that, but I have a message that's okay. important for me to deliver. I never expected Eddie Bernice Johnson to be one of my medical malpractice cases. And it is important for the world to know that Eddie Bernice Johnson opposed the law that devalued human life. No human being that dies from medical negligence in the state of Texas should have to suffer further with a $250,000 cap on that life. And today I say to Governor Abbott and our Republican legislature and our Republican leaders in the legislature, in the name and memory of Eddie Bernice Johnson, amend that law, call it the Eddie Bernice Johnson Amendment for the Value of Human Life and change that 20-year-old law so that the value of human life is more than $250,000 in Eddie Bernice Johnson's memory and the spirit of bipartisanship that she had all of her life. My last words to Eddie Bernice about three weeks ago were, I love you, and her response to me was, I love you too. We all here loved her, that's why we're here, and she loved all of us, and we will never stop fighting for her until the law is changed and the compensation is just. Thank you. Let the church say amen. amen. Give an honor to God, to Pastor Carter, the shepherd of this great church, and who is my pastor, ministers, Congress, Black Caucus, dignitaries. We haven't recognized if she has some constituents here, some people from the community, her peeps. So if you're here, I salute you, and also to this great music ministry that we have. And last but not least, to Kirk, to Sandra, and the family. Sandra, in the end, you weren't daughter-in-law. You were just daughter. I'm not a minister, but I'm the son of a black preacher, a Baptist preacher. And if I were going to take a text today, it would be from Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 21st and the 23rd verse. We're going to come back to that at the end. But I'd like for you to use your imagination and your mind as I go through in this two minutes and 45 seconds of the subject, job well done, EBJ, job well done. It was about 18 years ago Hiawatha, I was summoned to the office of Eddie Bernice Johnson. I had never met her, I had read about her, I had seen her on television. And I said, what does Eddie Bernice Johnson, Kurt, want with a hamburger flipper from Pleasant Grove? Anybody know about the Grove? <laughs> As I made my way to her office, this pioneer, this iconic trailblazer, I still thought, what does she want with this hamburger man from Pleasant Grove? When I walked into her office, I could see that she was dressed to the nines. And church, I don't know if you can help me say the three words. First one starts with saint. She was dressed in a Saint John's knit. And she was very direct. She talked to me as if she knew me. She said, Roland, I want to have a community picnic, an annual community picnic, but I want it to be sponsored by 
a business person from the community. So I said, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. And Kirk, for about 15 years, we would have a picnic in the summer for her constituents, her community, her peeps, not the big dignitaries, her community and her people. We would select a different park every year and we would even go as far as Fort uh, Worth to get black caterers. And during that time, Kirk, I earned favor with your mom. My family earned favor with Ms. Johnson. My employees are in favor. And we used to have sessions that we called, called Eddie Bernice Unplugged. And we would talk about different things. So she worked under five administrations. So an obvious question is, how did you measure presidents? Or who was your favorite president? And she said, Roland, I kept a list of how many times I flew on Air Force One. And the winner was number 42. Bill Clinton, as he said, they had met years before on the McGovern campaign trail. And she said when she flew on Air Force One, she would sit facing him. She said his favorite meal was biscuits and gravy. In fact, she said, if he finished sopping his gravy and still had biscuits, he would reach across in her plate <laughs> and sop that biscuit. I was hoping he was going to be here today because if somebody remember back in the 90s, K104 had a name for him. The second love of her life, we call him number one. I mean, the first, not the number one. Someone mentioned last night, the greatest love, more than being you know, a legislator, a nurse, was being a mother. The greatest love of her life was Kurt. <laughs> Kurt, I interacted, my family interacted with you and her in Dallas, in Austin, in Nashville, Tennessee, in Washington, DC. That love was evident. This week in the Dallas Morning News, you said, my mother gave all she had to Dallas. And she did go all she had. But something Dallas never got was that motherly love. And she left you with a platform. And there's a gentleman before me, used that platform to celebrate her community, her people. And my last story, Pastor Carter, is about a gentleman that she called her real hero, she said he was her best friend. His name was Edward Johnson. It was her father. If you use your imagination, she said that he was a trucker, had his trucking business. Sometimes she would sneak out of the bed when she was a little girl and wait on the front porch. So when he rolled up, he would see his little girl he would pick her up and hug her, and she would talk about she could feel the whiskers, his whiskers on her cheek and on her neck. She told me, Roland, there's a story he used to tell me, a little poem. Once a task is once begun, never quit until it's done. Man, mind blank. Whether the task is big or small, do it well or not at all. That's what go past the Carter to Mark, Matthew 23rd chapter. My good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. Come on up a little higher. I'll make you the ruler of many. Go and celebrate with your Lord. Eddie Bernice Johnson, job well done. Job well done, EBJ. Let the church say amen. the um, grandsons of Eddie Bernice Johnson. 
we want to just share a few things with you guys uh, today. Good morning. So I wanted to start off by saying um, the relationship that I had with my grandmother was very personal, but I will share two things, two stories that I have of her that will kind of stay with me as I continue to develop. And the first one has to do with uh, our Taiwan trip. So as many of you know, Granny was a, had a strong connection with the Taiwanese delegation throughout her many years. And she used to take many trips. Uh, she was a big fan of the delegation trips that they used to take. And one year, I was, it was in 2016, I had just transferred to UNT. I came from uh, Prairie View and I, I, I didn't really have as many, I didn't have the community that I had at PV as, as my HBCU grads know. So I felt myself getting lost and looking for a, something to something to do that summer. I'd already done internships and I'd already kind of determined where I was gonna go after I graduated, but I needed something to still do. And as y'all know, Granny, she's a worker. She's like, I can give you something to do. <laughs> and so it ended up me being in Taiwan for three weeks uh, at 21. Actually, I don't even think I was 21 yet. I think I may have been 20 years old. Not even old enough to drink in the States. She sent me on that Taiwanese delegation and she told me, now, no, when you get down there, you, you better know what you're talking about. You better not say the wrong thing and, you know, represent yourself like a man. And the relationships that I built on that trip are lifelong. Uh, some of the best friends I have today I met on that trip. And it, was, it just signifies an opportunity that she gave to me that she continues to give to a lot of her other colleagues, as we've seen. She's done it over many years. She did it for me then. And... I wanted to say this one part. After I graduated and I had already I did that delegation trip, I had my internships and I was in sales and I was working, I decided it was gonna be a good idea for me to try to come up to Dallas. I had big city dreams, you know, so I was like, let me try to come to Dallas and do sales and stay with Granny for one summer during one of her last, uh, last rounds in Congress. And one thing that I will say about Granny is, as you guys know, she was such a hard worker, but seeing it firsthand, her come home from Washington and still be working over the weekend. I mean, it could be her birthday, it could be Christmas around the corner, it could be daddy's birthday. She gonna be back in there working, and then she gonna end the night with some choirs, and she gonna end the night with, that, with the Catholic programming. Uh, she used to watch these these shows and it would be angelic singing all night and she used to fall asleep to that. And so she was a woman of God, you know, all the way to the end. And we will, we will gonna miss her very much. Thank you so much. You know, I had, um, I'm, I'm David, I'm uh, the middle son of Kirk and, and Sandra. Um, and I had some words prepared, but I'll be honest, you know, um, Y'all have basically said all of them, every quote, um, every reference. Um, and so, so I sort of resent being put so late in the, because I really could have knocked y'all over. But, um, you know, as James mentioned, you know, our relationship was deeply personal. You know, I think, um, you know, Granny was in politics our whole lives. But I must have been much older before I could really comprehend what that was, right? You know, or the gravity of it. Um, you know, we went on a, um, on a trip to, to Brazil. She took me to three different cities. We went with the big delegation, big group. And, um, and, it was, and that was really the first one-on-one, -on -one, like, individual um, experience that I'd had with Granny. Because believe it or not, I mean, she's as busy as y'all say she was. Right, I mean, and it's not that she wasn't accessible, um, but she always had something bigger going on with her than whatever you had going on in your life. But I know that when I went with her on that trip, it was, uh, we really bonded in a, in a deep way. And, um, and just that week with her, um, it, it, it just, it, it, like I mentioned, it, it forged a different bond. So, you know, you fast forward, I graduated from undergrad and I moved to Dallas, um, and I stayed with Granny for, the, for, for a couple of years. I stayed with her for about a year out of that two years, my first two years up here, or back here. 
And Granny was really open-minded. You know, I know, you know, a lot of folks have an opinion about how, how she was a fighter and all, and then she was, absolutely was. But she was a fantastic listener. And, and her and I could sit there. Sometimes we'd be up. This is like on a Monday, Tuesday night. We both got to go to work at 6, 7, 8 in the morning. But we would stay up until like 2 in the morning just talking. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. She could hear out any argument that I would make. You know, surprise, surprise, I don't know if y'all know, I don't agree with a lot of what, what, what her politics were. Or, or I disagree with enough of it to have a good conversation with her. You know, we probably agreed on 95% of everything. But uh, she could stand that. Uh, she, she was just so, um, she was humble enough to have her ignorant grandson across from her try to tell her something about politics. <laughs> you know, and, and that's kind of what I mean. It's like, you know, the vision that people have of Granny versus what we have. And I, I mean, you know, sure, a lot of it is similar. Um, but it was a different type of relationship because for me, it was, Granny was just, she was one of the most humble people that I knew. You know, she was one of the most gracious people that I knew. You know, we begged Granny for years to retire. We, we just wanted her to ourselves. And, um, but she felt obligated and, and she, and she felt, uh, she appreciated the trust that, that the people uh, who supported her put in her. And that, and that really meant something to her. She wanted to make good on that trust that you'd given her. She didn't want to, you know, uh, um, um, fall short of what she felt like she'd committed to, you know. So, um, and I'm rambling. I, like I say, I mean, you know, our relationship, very deeply personal. But, but just, just to, this is one last thing I'll tell you about Granny. You know, this is, um, it, it'll, it'll give you an idea of what that work ethic was like. You know, I had a job where I would go in at like 5.30 in the morning, 6 o'clock. But like I say, Granny would work all through the night. She'd be the first one up, first one out. Um, and one day the alarm is going off in the, in, in the condo. And it's like loud, right? It's, it's loud. There's, there's flashers. I thought it was a terrorist attack. So I grab my pistol and I go and I, get, I think I got to get my grandma out of this place. I don't know what's going on. I, I really thought it was a terrorist attack. Granny is in her bed, sprawled out. She has briefings just sprawled out on her where she's falling asleep, working. And I say, Granny, we got to go. We got, and she's like, oh, no, 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 that's nothing. That happens all the time. She just went right back out. <laughs> and, um, you know, you, you know, and that morning, like I said, she was the first one out. You know, um, so, you know, the work ethic was real. This isn't, this isn't something that uh, she didn't brag about that. It wasn't something that she did to impress anyone. She did it because she felt obligated. She felt that, that she owed you because she appreciated you. She appreciated the trust that you gave in her. Um, and, and then one last thing, too, I, I wanted to make sure um, it was clear, and y'all know, that every compliment, every expression of love that you gave her was, was truly felt by her. That was something that she did not take for granted. The way she would talk about Gary, Rod Hall, DeMarcus, um, Les, Marat, Esperanza. I, I mean, I don't want to, I'm going to mess up if I start trying to name names. But she would talk about y'all as if y'all were her grandchildren, as if you were her children. You know, in many cases, I know more about y'all than y'all probably know about us. Because she liked to brag on y'all. Because she really did appreciate you. Last thing before I give it over to my big brother was that um, there's, there's, I know I said that about four, four times. The thing that I'm gonna miss the most about my grandma, y'all know this, when she would walk into a room, you know Granny came to town, she would go, hello. And it's, um, it's gonna be tough not to hear that anymore for my, my daughters, uh, my wife, who was also close with her. Uh, we appreciated Granny, we loved her dearly, and she loved y'all. She really did love y'all. I, um, wow, David, <laughs> I love my brother. If you guys know, David is not typically the most boisterous, at least until the end part of the night. Um, and then he lets it all out, but that was beautiful, David. Um, a few things that I want to share with you guys about my grandmother. I am Dorrance Kirk Johnson II. I am the oldest grandson 
of Eddie Bernice Johnson, and I'm, a pr I'm so proud to be uh, her oldest grandson. Um, one thing about Granny is that she had a very, very good way of never, ever letting me, David or James, think that we were the, the favorite grandson. She found a way for all of us somehow to believe that we were the favorite grandson. I'm here to tell y'all now it was me. <laughs> um, I want to talk about her influence and the way that she influenced my family and me and the way that we see and think and the way, the way, the way we treat people. Um, and it was just when I was young, everybody would always be so in awe of her. They would, it always felt like they were looking up to her and when she would come in the room, tight, tighten up. And I was just like, don't y'all understand that that's just granny? She was my grandmother, my granny. And so I, when I was so young, I just, I, it did not make sense to me, but I, I understand now, I, I get it now. And so when I was a child, I thought like a child, but I've, I've lived this life and I've seen her through all the things that she's done. I'm not a child anymore and I can see it, I can feel it, I can taste it, and I miss it. And I want it back. Um, Granny had a, um, she had a way of being very, she was a, she was a disciplinarian, contrary to popular belief, and um, <laughs> My granny never, ever, ever once had to spank me. And if you know me, you know that's crazy. Uh, that's crazy. She never once had to spank me. It was just a look. It was just the thought of just disappointing her was all that I needed. Now, the fact that granny didn't do spankings, that did not rub out. She didn't pass that down. My kids, I'm sorry, we, <laughs> we operate differently. I can't do that. Granny didn't get that to me. She took that with her. Um, but she had just the best way of being so fierce, but, it, but also so feminine. So powerful, but yet dainty. And she is the pure, pure epitome of class and elegance. She was a champion of education. She made sure that we always got our books. That was, it was huge. And she has three grandsons, college graduates. And I know she's proud of that. And she influences my children and my daughters. And she gave my daughters a true role model to look up to. wrap up so um, I have a few memories of granny uh, let's mention her driving I remember granny used to uh, she used to put me in her lap and she would drive and she would drive around the neighborhood this is back in the 80s y'all it was a long time ago <laughs> don't judge her but she would put me that was some of my earliest memories as a child my grandmother would put me in her lap and she would drive I remember <laughs> I can't tell y'all that part <laughs> but it but I did that to my children. I'm not going to lie in the 2000s, because Granny did it for me, so I did it for mine, too. Um, some of the memories I have, when she would come to our house for Christmas, she would come with a trunk load of poinsettias, and there would be poinsettias everywhere. And every time I ever see another poinsettia, I would think of my grandmother. But those type of memories, those things will never leave me. The lessons that she taught us will never leave. They will always be here. They will live on. Um, she had such a maternal instinct that I just, God, I just want to hug her one more time. Um, but her legacy will live on. Her legacy will live on. I see her face in the faces of my children, of my daughters and my sons. The lessons that she has that she's given to my father who have given them to me and my brothers. Um, 
those are things that will never leave us. And so as we celebrate her life, as we celebrate all the great things that she's done and all the, her accomplishments, I just want you guys to understand how much she truly, truly, truly meant to this world. And we really, really lost one. She was one of one. There will never be another EBJ. There will never be another EBJ. We love you, Granny. Hi, um, I'm Kennedy Lee Winter Johnson, and me and my cousin, we have a few words. We might be young, but we've learned a lot from my great-grandmother, Eddie Bernice. Here's what she taught us. Work hard every day and never give up when things get tough. Be kind to everyone. Be strong here and here. Girls can be good at math and science. No, girls can be great at math and science. Always, always remember family comes first and always do the right thing even if it's not fun. We will never forget what you taught us, Granny. We love you and we will miss you every day. Well, here we are. Let me first say thank you to this church, this pastor. To the other ministers on the rostrum, thank you. To the other ministers in this community that are here, thank you. To this wonderful choir. Now, I may not get through all of this because if you know me, you know that I'm prone to cry. I have had a wonderful life, a wonderful mother, and I have felt blessed to have shared her with you. So for, I'm an only child, but I don't feel like an only child. My mother has sons and daughters throughout this room, throughout this city, and I would imagine that many of them are feeling the same way that I am. Not really at a loss, but just different now, just different. One of her, one of the ways that she would start saying things when she wanted your attention. She would say, let me just say this. <laughs> and when she said, let me just say this, she was not scolding you. She was helping you to understand her point of view. Yes, yeah, she served this community she loved this community. We wanted this service to be open to the public because she was for the public. She believed everyone should have the respect, the love as God's child. Didn't matter your color, it didn't matter your religion, she believed that God never made a mistake. Let me say one thing that my good friend Jim Clavin said. He said once that EBJ stands for everybody's joy. That <laughs> yes, 
Yes, my mother was a sharp dresser. But she was more than a sharp dresser. That was what you needed to see so that you understood that what came out of her mouth meant something. When you saw her, she meant every word that she said. Now, let me also say that my mother was in public service for all of my life, all of my children's life. We understand the enterprise. We understand that it takes more than one person to serve. It takes a supportive family, it takes supportive friends, it takes supportive staff. So I would like for anyone that has ever worked for her that helped serve this community to stand. They knew that if you worked for EBJ, it was going to be hard work. You could not outwork her. You know, you had to go home to your families. You had to get something to eat. And she would be sending out instructions overnight. But it was all for the love of her community. She loved this city. And I want to thank this city and the mayor. I want to thank this city for showing her on her way out what she has done for this city. It was a beautiful send-off. Now, I won't get too emotional. I'll try not to, so some things I'm not going to say. But let me just say this. Let's set some things straight. My mother, when she died, was 89 years old. She was born in 1934. The rumor was that she was born in 1935. She started that rumor. <laughs> and let me tell you why. The news media has a habit of not reading all of what is written. So she would always be, her birthday was at the end of the year, December the 3rd. But come January the 1st, she was always the next year older because all they saw was the year. So she said, well, I'm going to fix that. <laughs> so instead of her being her age for only 28 days of the year, she changed the year. So yes, many of you were confused, and I understand that. It's OK. But she was born in 1934. She was 89 years old, 89 wonderful years. My mother was a Johnson and married a Johnson. And my father, Lacey Kirk Johnson, who was the son of D. Edwin Johnson. Now, many, many of you know my mother. But my father comes from a very influential family in this city and in this state. And my mother, yes, she was from Waco, graduated top of her class. But as good as she was at her school, she was not good enough or white enough to attend Baylor University in her hometown. She left the state to go to St. Mary's College at the University of Notre Dame to study nursing. At that time, there was no nursing school in the state of Texas that would allow an African American to become a registered nurse. That's the way it was. And when she came back to Texas, she had an unusual name for a professional. You know, in the days when they read your resume, 
When she was hired and recruited to come to Dallas at the Veterans Hospital, they thought she was a man because they had many male nurses in the Veterans Administration system. But they also didn't realize that she was black. She was coming from the University of Notre Dame, St. Mary's College. They just assumed she's going to be a white man. Lo and behold, as the story goes. <laughs> so she showed up on time and early. She was always early. She would never be late. And she sat for several hours waiting on this interview. And they finally said, well, we're done for the day. You know, how can we help you? Well, I'm here to take this job. Well, they thought the fella didn't show up because they were looking for a white man. <laughs> so, yes, she did become eventually the chief psychiatric nurse at the Veterans Hospital here in Dallas. And that served her well, as she would say many times in Congress. Her experience with dealing her experience with dealing with the psychological <laughs> challenges <laughs> served her well, <laughs> served her well. But let me finish um, to the leaders in this community. I think it is apropos Yes, her death was untimely and unnecessary. Untimely and unnecessary. But God knows best. He chose to take her on one, two, three, one, two, three. There will never, never be another one, two, three, one, two, three. She was unique. She was special, but she left at the end of the year. This is a new year. She leaves you without the burden of having to try to equal her accomplishments. She leaves you to start anew, take up the mantle. This is a new year. We have new leaders. Leaders, stand up. Be your own leader. Have your own style. I think it's apropos that you have a fresh start, a fresh year, and let's see what you do with it. Let's see what you do with it. And um, I think I'll leave it there. I have a wonderful family. You see these wonderful sons. I have beautiful grandchildren that loved her, that knew her. My beautiful aunt, my mother and my aunt were competitors. They were intellectual competitors. I think it's interesting that they both have schools named after them. So education, community service, and loyalty to her community is what she should be remembered for. Thank you for coming, and I turn it back over to Reverend Carter. Amen, amen. We are now preparing for our eulogy. We will have a musical selection by the daughter in love, Sandra Dilworth Johnson, as she comes. Pray for her. And then directly following her, we will have our eulogy from a close family friend, the Reverend Michael Wayne Walker, retired administrative minister, Messiah Baptist Church, Brockton, Massachusetts.
let me just say this. She could say, in addition to let me just say this, she could say, Wayney, Weedy Wiki. And she could join Julius Caesar in uttering those words because truly, she came, she saw, and she conquered. <laughs> Pastor Carter has been such a gracious man. Right, right. <laughs> Not only to Kirk and this beautiful family, but to me personally, I thank you. Amen. And since he's been so kind, I'm about to take a liberty. As you are able, would you all please just stand for a minute? As you're able. Now, I know that some of you are not here physically. Uh, some of you are... are on Concord Church, Dallas, and looking online. So wherever you are, you, wherever you are, you stand as well, please. All right, now here's what I want you to do. Here's a little exercise, and you don't have to be here physically to do it. Uh, just, just, just turn around for a minute. Just make a, just turn. Okay, now here's the exercise. Turn back around. Here's the exercise, here's the exercise. Would everyone in here, Please face north. Turn north. <laughs> Turn north. All right, you can be seated. <laughs> In the words of Walter Earl Fluka in his powerful monogram, Ethical Leadership, Fluka says, isn't it good that our ancestors knew which way north was? Let me just say this. Yeah, yeah. God knew you before you knew you. God is the creator. You are the creation. You're God's child. You're God's child. You're God's idea. You are God's ideation. You are who God knows you to be. In the beginning, in our KHO logo, in the beginning, God, and then God said, let us make earthlings and let us make those earthlings in our image and in our likeness. So you see, God knew you before you knew you. So you're not just your idea of you. You're not society's idea of you. You are the you that God made you to be. Yes, sir. Now, just imagine, just imagine. Let's, uh, let me do a little hypothetical here. If there were a time machine, and if you had the time machine, 
before you were born, before creation, if there were a time machine and you could decide of all of history, you could decide who you would be, you could decide where you would be, you could decide where you would be born, you could even decide when you would be. In all of creation, you enter the time machine and you can decide who you want to be, where you want to be, when you want to be. All those are your decisions. Now that's clearly hypothetical. But in truth, God, the omnipotent one, the omniscient one, God had that option. And God not only had the option, God made the call. God determined who you would be, when you would be, where you would be, and God designed you when and where and who. Therefore, if God had the option in all of creation, of putting us when God wanted us, where God wanted us, what God wanted us, who God wanted us, then clearly God has something for you. God has something for you because God has not created in a vacuum. God created each of us in a historical context, in a social context, context in a familial context God made us who we are where we are and when we are so there is something very special for each and every one of us to do let me just say this Leon Wright in his powerful monograph, From Cult to Cosmos, Wright says, know who you are and know what you stand for. But always remember to adapt and to evolve. Let me just say this. It is not a contest over how woke we are. It's about what we generate, what we pass down. It's about what kinds of bodies we are making possible. What kind of souls we are making possible. What kind of lives we are making possible. What stories are we giving birth to? What worlds are we creating for others to live in? Without question, Pastor Brian Carter, not only for this family, and the way Pastor Carter has opened the doors. But Pastor Carter, without question, is the apotheosis of a gentleman. And I thank you. Never met such a kind and generous and hospitable soul. And of all the things, I truly thank you for a parking space. I had to walk all the way across the street last night. Like Mrs. Johnson, Pastor Carter exemplifies the humanity validating work of freedom. The work, in the words of Fred Moten, the work of fugitivity and the work of love. The work of fugitivity and the work of love that expands our moral 
imaginaries. You see, Mrs. Johnson wanted, as you have heard in different voices today, Miss Johnson wanted freedom. She wanted freedom for these children these grandchildren, these great-grandchildren. She wanted freedom for all of us. She wanted freedom because she recognized that we all need the freedom of being. We need that just as I am kind of freedom. We need that I am fearfully and wonderfully made kind of freedom. We need that if God be for us, who can be against us kind of freedom. We need that for me to live is Christ kind of freedom. We need that I am, that I am kind of freedom. We need that Wakanda forever kind of freedom and Mrs. Johnson knew in the words of Nikki Young in her black queer ethics we need a freedom that emanates from an undeniable and an unapologetic knowledge about who we are an undeniable and unapologetic memory of who we are and a return to who we are. Let me just say this, because you will remember, it's actually in John chapter 11, you remember there when Jesus went to the last visit Lazarus? Jesus went to the grave. You'll remember when Jesus got to the grave, Jesus says, show me where you've laid him. In other words, show me his, his neighborhood. Show me his, his habitat. Show me the, the playground. Show me his school. Show me where you laid him. And you remember what happened? Only Jesus could call Lazarus to come forth. Only Jesus could make that call and tell him to come forth. But the interesting thing about that text is before Jesus called, which only Jesus could do, the friends of Lazarus, they could roll the stone away. Our task, we were told to knock it off, get over ourselves, Our task, wherever we are, is to roll the stones away. Kirk said it's a new year. Kirk said she's done hers. Let's do ours. So our task is to roll stones away. Now notice that text. Notice John chapter 11. When you get to verse 39, Jesus looks at them and says, you take the stones away. Verse 40, they do some talk back and forth. Then in verse 41, Jesus, the text says, verse 41, they took the stone away. Now that was 39, 41. And then in 43, verse 43, Jesus now calls in a loud voice. And he calls Lazarus and says, come forth. Now 39, Jesus says, you take the stone away. 41, they took the stone away. 43, Jesus now calls and says, come forth. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't call until they rolled the stone away? 
Now you want to know how they, Jesus, verse 39, Jesus said, roll the stone away. In 41, they did roll it away. Verse 40, that's protocol. That's institutional inertia. That's going through the procedures. That's doing things right instead of doing the right things. That's going through all the mechanisms and procedures. But then eventually they get to 41 and they take the stone away. How many people, how many people are in graves today waiting for God to call them forth? And God is ready to call them forth, only waiting for us to roll the stones away. Mrs. Johnson said, Kirk helped us out with the year there, 1934 instead of 35, she said, when she was in her mother's womb, she said there were no sonograms in those days. And because there were no sonograms, she says, her mother did not know if she would be a boy or a girl. But there was one thing her mother did know. Her mother knew she would be born black. Now, isn't it interesting? 1934 or 35, whichever rumor has it, isn't it interesting that there are health risks, the health risk in our society from 1934 to 2023 are still not randomly distributed. Still today, in the words of, of Robert Bullard, of Emily Towns, Mitzi Smith, there are certain neighborhoods where there are waste dumps. Certain neighborhoods of factories or of landfills. Certain neighborhoods with sewage plants. Certain neighborhoods with highways cutting through them and running over them. Certain neighborhoods with hazardous waste industries and with pesticides. Certain neighborhoods. Health risks are not randomly distributed. Rates of asthma. God did not intend for poor black and brown children to have asthma more than anyone else. It's neighborhoods. God did not plague and God did not intend for there to be reproductive neighborhoods and reproductive problems with certain women outnumbering others. Those are stones. Those are stones. Living in a society with a sick care system Sick care, it's sick care because something's wrong with the society. If I go to an emergency room or if I get hurt walking or riding in the car, if I go to an emergency room, something's wrong. If folk want to know what insurance do I have before they check to see what's wrong with me, sick care. Sick care is a stone. Something wrong with a society where big pharma controls the price of everything and where one state, one country, one insurance group, same medication, but different prices. Those are stones. Poverty, in the words of Charles Derber, poverty is the worst form of violence because it never lets up. Poverty is a stone. 
One in six children in this country going to bed hungry every night. Hunger is a stone. Prison industrial complex. To use H. Dean Trulia's term, the prison industrial complex is a stone. Something's wrong with this. And just notice, notice even the language. It says Mrs. Johnson worked on the Texas prison system. When is the last time you visited a penitentiary? Matter of fact, when is the last time you even heard of a penitentiary? See, even the word is a stone. We used to have penitentiaries in this country. The word penitentiary is a direct root derivative of the Latin word penitia. Penitia means repentance. Hence, the word penitentiary is a place you go to repent. And you know the word repent simply means turn around. So a penitentiary you messed up. Now you go to the penitentiary. That's a place you turn around. But we don't do penitentiaries anymore. We now have departments of correction because we don't help you turn around. We don't help you repent. We want to punish. Punishment is a stone. Brother Anthony Penn in his powerful work, hip hop, hip hop and the thanatological narratives of blacks, narration of blackness. Penn says the largest segment, the fastest growing segment of the prison population today is women. Women are going to prison in greater rates than anyone else. Speaking of correction, isn't it sad that if a woman is in prison and she's pregnant, in many states, that woman is shackled as she gives birth. And once the baby comes forth, the baby is taken from the mother. That's a stone. Why not let the baby hug and touch the mama, lay on the mama's breast? And why not do as other systems do, let the baby stay there in prison with the mama? Yeah. At least two, three years. Yeah. A baby's a baby. Baby don't care where they are. They with mama, they with mama. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a stone. Let me just say this. Look at some of the stones in our society. Racial injustice is a stone. Education injustice is a stone. Immigration injustice is a stone. Global South injustice is a stone. Economic injustice, worker injustice, environmental injustice, health injustice, LBG2QIA plus is a stone. Trans injustice is a stone. Miss Eddie said, Ronald Reagan came into office. And Reagan came in office and said, we want trickle-down economics. Wow. Miss Eddie Bernice Johnson said, I'm tired of getting trickle-down on. <laughs> trickle-down economics yes, is a stone. Right. And we were told last night, county judge told us last night, that when he went into office, he got a call from Miss Johnson and she told him, the emphasis is not your title, it's not your office. Your job is to move stones. So whoever you are today, whatever position you hold, however powerful you hold, your power is not in your title. 
not in your office. You are there to move stones. Teddy Roosevelt, I don't care much for his politics, but he was quite prolific with the quotes. Roosevelt said, in times of crises, in times of crises, the best decision you can make, the best thing you can do is to do the right thing. The next best thing you can do is to do the wrong thing. The worst thing you can do is nothing. And we don't want to say it here, and many of you don't want to hear it, but if truth be told, many of our churches in the African diaspora are stones. Habitual religion, shriveled spirituality, piecemeal theology is a stone. Nobody, the status quo, the power elite could care less about you praise and worshiping all day long. Just don't make change in society. Praise and worship all you want. Just don't educate folk and let them know they can make a difference in this world. Miss Country, Miss Johnson said, our country has come too far. Our country has come too far. We've made too much progress to have our rights stripped away now. We cannot, and she said, we will not go back. The march is not yet over. The fight has not yet been won. She said, let's get beyond petty politics. Let's join hands with one another. Let's have solidarity in the face of catastrophe. So in the words and the sentiments of Ms. Johnson, let's talk together. Let us pray together. Let us sing together. Let us worship together. Let us stand together. Let us fight together. Let us collaborate together. Let us smile together. Let us dance together. Let us cry together. Let us laugh together. Let us struggle together. Let us organize together and let us head north together. What a word. What a word. What a word. Come on, let's praise God one more time for a powerful, powerful eulogy. And while you're clapping, would you help us to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Eddie Bernice Johnson one more time in this room. Let's give God praise for her. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you to each of you for coming to celebrate her life today. We would ask in the days and weeks and months ahead that you would continue to keep this family in your prayers as they continue in this journey. At this time, would everyone with the exception of the family Please stand. Funeral directors, we are now in your hands. 